is the life jog, also known as the life journey of growth. What up, what up, what up, family? Um, I hope you guys are doing very well tonight. I hope you guys are hearing me very well. Let me put this mic on mute. I hope you guys are doing well. You guys uh, are hearing me very well. Um, it's once again, it's Tuesday night. Is the night where we talk about um, our Empower and Inspire podcast where we come out we bring out uh, cool people where that 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 share the experience their journey so that you can learn uh we can learn too and we can all grow together and um as you already know for those who are listening to this podcast for the first time this is the life jog aka the life journey of growth where we invest in ourselves we grow we learn to become better versions of ourselves not only for ourselves but for our children and those coming after us and uh yeah this is just a journey that my wife and i uh decided to go on and we br we're bringing in a few people here and there from time to time and today we have a very special man is very special man this guy this guy there's a long story between him and i it's a long story but he is a special man and i'm just not i'm not gonna do a disservice to his introduction because if i have to introduce this guy i'm gonna spend two days here <laughs> just talking about him but long story short uh we have a we have a very interesting episode today with germinal germinal j van uh he's an independent scholar and author of 18 books 18 books on political science economics econometrics and statistics so if you are a lover a fanatic of math of statistics even of political science because this guy is just a wealth of information he love information he he like this guy is anyway anyway germinal story is very engaging and he rebranded himself I, and that's one of the the cool thing about his story that i wanted to bring to the table because there's going to be young people out there and even with the covid and the pandemic that's happening that that's happening to all of us for the past year um G uh, germinal is a perfect example of rebranding yourself to adapt to the job market rebranding yourself to adapt to the reality of the world and he went from being a person that breathed breathe when i say this guy used to breathe political science i like when you talk politics this was the guy he went from political science to mathematics and it's it's really fascinating just to just hear the power of transformation the how the brain is able to stretch like the perfect example of neuroplasticity is right here <laughs> we, we can talk about so many things with this man today but uh i just want to underline that he is a very great man he's um i love his humility i love everything about him um everything that he does and even how he brings information um to the next generation how he teaches um it's just pure from his passion and just his love for sharing information acquiring information and just making everybody around him a better person um i don't know i can talk about him forever but anyway we're gonna get into it so germinal mr germinal j van how you doing man uh louis um I'm, I'm glad to be on your on your platform it's it's, it's an honor i've always wanted to come and you finally gave me the opportunity i know you had mike previously i was happy yeah. i was a little jealous too because i was not there but you finally gave me that opportunity and i want to say thank you for that uh so you, my, name, my name is germinal gerard van so the g in the middle stands for gerard it's not just a nickname it's actually my real name gerard van and uh i was born and raised in in the republic of ivory coast uh, for those who are not familiar for the english speak speakers who are not familiar it's a uh, french speaking country on the shores of west africa and uh, i did my elementary and secondary education in uh, back in abidjan 
I also um, went to middle school in Kenya for four years. That's where I learned English for the first time. It was a struggle. And I also learned not to live with my parents. Then I was 11 or 12 years old when I first started living without my parents. And, uh, and I came back home. That's when I did my high school. And back in high school, uh, in, in Africa, we have majors. For those who are not familiar with the system, Louis knows a little bit about this. Uh, we have majors, and in fact, I used to major in math, physics, and biology. And I was not, I like math, but I wasn't passionate about it. And I used to not understand uh, the reason why we use mathematics. And we will get into that uh, a little later in, the, in this interview. But I, I used to like math, but I was resentful about it too, because our professor used to not teach us well. So I majored in that, I did not do well. And so when I failed the baccalaureate, I uh, switched majors. I majored in qualitative studies, so classics such as French literature, philosophy, history, geography, and etc. And I did well. And at hold that on, time, hold, I on, was hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, you're already going into the lecture here, man. Just listen. You gave it too much information to the people here. So let me let me let me re re recap a little. Let me step back now. For those of you who don't know, if you most most of our, of our listeners of this podcast actually are located in the United States of America. Funny enough, most of that of our listener are in the United States, and the the way the school system is designed in the U.S. You have uh, you have K through 12, so from kindergarten to grade 12. So you have kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, tenth, eleven, twelve, and then after the, after you pass, you finish high school, then you go on and um, you go on into university or college. The way it works in a French system, you have uh, you do have elementary and then you have secondary. And then secondary usually go from CZM until terminal, which is basically from sixth grade to 12th grade, technically, right? So the way it works, once you get to 10th grade, that's which is equivalent to second. Once you get to 12th grade, you um, you start majoring in a specific trade. I, I would say kind of like you call it major. So you can go into the track of math and science, which is what he did. Math, physics, chimie, which is series C. Okay. Um, and then you can go into the track of biology, which is series D, I believe, right? Is it say B? No, B. Accounting. Is it, is it, is it right? Yeah. I, I, it's been it's been 17 years. So at last when I left, I was in I was in 10th grade when I left the system. But long story short is that once you get into 10th grade, going to 12, you only do like really um kind of like high level math from 10 until 12 before you go to university. So I want to get I want you to guys to think a little bit about this guy. He went into 10th grade for two, for three years, basically, was doing high level math, physics, uh, math, math, physics and chemistry and biology. And then after he failed the 12th grade uh, exam, which is a graduation exam, usually what people do, they go back and retake the exam. But he decided to change major. Yo, I don't even know why in your head you start. You thought about changing major at the like legit. This is the last year. Just redo it again and like, why did you decide to redo the whole major? Well, I mean, at that time I was very inclined to history, and my taste for politics already grew. I was already a good writer. I even started writing books already, but I never finished. So my mom knew that I had a uh, qualitative skill. I knew how to write. So she said, you should go and major in literature, which I did at the time. So when I succeed with distinction, I have to precise that, you know, one strike. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Points. Hold on, man. So you tell me that you failed the C, you changed major to A, and then... A1, you, so A1. So A1. So, and then you yeah, go so, to A1. Go ahead, go ahead. Go, no, you, go, you go to A1 and yeah, then so, you pass with, with uh, high marks, basically. 
Yeah, yeah with high marks. Yeah, because so in A you have two, you have A one and A two. Yeah. A two is pure literature for qualitative people. A one is uh, qualitative with math because mm. I have some math background, so I could still do math. Yeah, mm. and I did really well in math. I have, I, I, I remember I got a ninety three in math on, on the exam. I did really well that year. Yeah, and then I came to the US to study politics at the Catholic University of America. Wait, this is crazy, man. This is crazy. Your story is really crazy because I, I've never seen somebody that just like fails the baccalaureate and then decide to do go change major. So you didn't have to go to second premiere. You didn't have to go to like 10th, 11th. You just no, went, no, no. you stayed in terminal oh. and you just flipped. And then like, I you never see anybody do that in the system. You never, That's I've right. never seen. It's very rare. So you just say, I like writing, but I'm a math person. You, you know, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to specify this thing. If you come from the French system, you already know. If you are a math, physics, and biology brain, you hate writing. That's a fact. We hate. Like I used to, I used to despise. Like don't even bring writing, the English, French literature. Don't no, no. I we had something that we call coefficient, and coefficient was the equalizer in the game, in the playing, in the playing game. So, so in the playing field, so it was like, uh, you know, with the coefficient four in math and coefficient three, you know, I know if I fail literature, I can I can balance everything out with my physics, and that was me. <laughs> that was me. I used to hate literature so much. Wow, that's really interesting. Man. That's interesting. That's interesting. So, and, so basically, uh, yeah, you, you, know, you, wanted, uh, you wanted to tell you went into no, the, the A major, and then you were so basically, and that's what I love about going back into the history of people. You can definitely see from a younger age that you already had the quality of rebranding yourself. Yes, yes. Okay. I, I, I always believe uh, that uh, you have to be open minded. But we will, I will extend to that in a little bit. Mm-hmm. I will extend to that in a little bit. Thank so, you. Um, yeah, you know, I, I want to keep the story a little juicy. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I came to the U.S. in 2010 with a student visa and uh, I studied political science, and that's where I met Louis on campus, uh, a bright man, a very scientist, a, an engineer, a, a great soccer player. Oh my God. <laughs> you you want to play with him rather than play against him. And <laughs> we and I we always we always click from the first from the get go because I mean the language is all it's a very strong tool to connect people. So mm-hmm. when you see your African brother, your African fellow in a school mostly populated by by whites, it's always good bound. So That's we and right. I we spend a lot of time together. But we yeah. graduated. I think you graduated 2012. 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, two years before me. And uh, it's interesting because at Catholic University, people knew me as the future president of Africa. That was <laughs> the second chapter of my life. Yeah. And I sworn by all means on the grave of whoever that I will be the president of my country. And I was convinced. I was convinced. Yeah. And, uh, and, as you what, grow, what happened, man? Like, yeah. like what yeah, I started, what I, what I started saying you with like mathematics. I was like, what is going on with this guy? This guy, <laughs> I knew he was going to be the next politician. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I was, um, I was convinced, but when I went to grad school, uh, 2015, I was still thinking about doing politics back home and everything, but it was 2016. And it, and it wasn't that something specific happened necessarily. It's just a thought process. Mm-hmm. In life, if there's one thing I can tell you is that it's important to be true to yourself. Mm-hmm. Yes, you have your skills you have, and you have your ideas, but there is a huge rift between your what you have in your head and what the reality is. Mm-hmm. And I used to see I used to idealize politics. I used to romanticize politics. To me, politics was the game of ideas when you debate about you know left-right ideologies. 
But politics is not in Africa. It's not about theologies. It's it's about <laughs> people are hungry. They want to eat, and they're willing to follow whoever gives them the most food. Exactly. And yeah, there was no ideology, and I realized that I would not fit. That was the first red flag. The second red flag was even my mindset. I do not have a mindset that I realized that my mindset would have not been compatible with the mindset back in Africa. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you say that? Well, the reason is that I'm someone who strongly believes in individualism and private property. Ooh. And yes, I strongly believe. To me, it's it's literally a religion. This, the way Christians believe in Jesus Christ is the way I believe in private property. What I work for is for me. I decide to do I, I I share because I want to, not because the culture forced me to share it. And the problem is that back home, the mentality is that the culture forced you to share it. Hmm. You know you're about to catch fire here, man. So the culture. And I, 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 I'm totally aware of that, but I, I, I'm not also going to change because that's what people feel like. You know, absolutely, I am absolutely. I am. Absolutely, and and, 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 that's and, 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 and let me let me ask you something. So, yeah, right. yeah. so you believe you strongly believe in private property, that whatever whatever you have is yours, not not just basically like whatever you have is everybody's because that's just how things are supposed to be. Do you want to expand in that from your per, your perspective of yeah, private sure. property? Sure, and I even explained that in my 13th book, uh, no, my 12th book, oh my God, so many, uh, Classical Liberalism in Africa, where I actually mm -hmm. expand on my personal thought. And I say that the reason why the continent is not thriving is because we tend to fool ourselves by believing that we are socialists. And by socialists, mm -hmm. that we share whatever we have, we share, we have to share. Uh, property together but there are so many empirical evidence that prove that clearly that when you when you make property something common mm -hmm. people don't thrive because no one takes responsibility but when it's for you only mm -hmm. you know what 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 is the work you have to put in order for that thing to grow louis mm -hmm. i'm going to ask you something go ahead the life journey of growth yeah. Try to make that a public property and let's see how it will be run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? The channel yeah. you own right now, that's your property. Yeah. Only you know the, the time and effort you invest to make that thing run. That's your business. Mm -hmm. It's for you. Yes. And you get a return on your investment. Mm -hmm. Take the life or take take the life job, right? And make the private a public property for for a year. And let's see. And, and we're going to see the results. I guarantee mm -hmm. you that is going to fail. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing. So, that is the problem. Yeah. So private property, uh, when you know, private property um, breeds uh, competition. Absolutely. You, okay. And it's competition that, that, that breeds uh, economic uh, growth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, no one can, 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 no one can take off your property better than yourself. As I said, you can experience it yourself. Give mm -hmm. me life jog and let's see if I run it the way you run it. <laughs> let's see. That's you will see it. for yourself that I will fail your thing because it's not mine. I don't yeah. know how to run it. So if I fail it, I don't take any responsibility for it. I'm not, I don't care. And that's what happens with when property is or when goods are owned communally rather than mm. privately. Mm. That's, that's so, so the private sector so basically this kind of goes in in contradiction with the whole process of ubuntu the whole concept Absolutely. of ubuntu so, so so when everybody say ubuntu is uh, go moving the ubuntu way is the is the way that's going to free africans you from your perspective in the field of political science you f you found out that the Ubuntu way in politics doesn't work. No, it doesn't. And Julius Nyerere, who actually conceptualized this 
in a political way because Julius Nyerere was the president of Tanzania. He's the one who created the Ubuntu, the collectivization, yeah. the civilization of the of the resources. Mm -hmm. You can go. You you can simply go on Google. You type Tanzania GDP from 1960 to 1980. You will see that their GDP was not that great. That is, that it was great. Tanzania GDP. Yeah. Let me see. Tanzania GDP yeah, from Tanzania what time? GDP. From, from what time? From the 1960s, from the 1960s to the 1980s. To 1980s. You see, and compare it, and you can compare it to the one with Ivory Coast. You mm -hmm. will see the difference. You then will that see that takes... private property wins. <laughs> I've, I've made yeah. a lot of studies on that. Even, even on the book that you have on the economic development of West Africa, I've, 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 I've made a study on that. So this is a book that he's talking about. By the way, for those who are new, I see there's five people now. We are live with uh, Germano Gerald Van. Oh, Natiri, you are Natiri. Tu ne dors pas. Merci beaucoup, Natiri. Merci, 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 merci. Um, the economic development of West Africa uh, in the 21st century. Uh, Germano wrote. This is your 17th book, right? This is no, 16. this book exactly is my 13. This is your 13 book. He wrote yeah. 18 books so far. And this is the 13 book where he actually breaks down. Uh, he, he's, he's, he, he's providing a theoretical and empirical analysis from a neoclassical perspective on how um, a, a, an economic system for West Africa, because he's from West Africa, he understand. And this will be, as the story go, you're going to understand why. I wanted him to be live with us today because he's a he's into a field that I feel like there's not a lot of people that talk about it, which is econometric statistic. We're gonna go into it, but this is one of the books that he's talking about when he says what he says. So keep going. Naturi, merci beaucoup. Yeah. Merci beaucoup, Naturi. <laughs> yeah, so um yeah, and and uh and you have overwhelming empirical evidence that show that when you collectivize resources it doesn't produce output at least the output that is produced is not efficient mm -hmm. it's not efficient hello well, i think we we lost him for a second i hope your internet comes back So little technical problem is going to come back. His internet is acting up. But uh, I just want to say thank you. Naturi, thank you again once more, one more time. Hello, il est 3h30 du matin. Merci. Bon life. Bon soirée. Uh, okay, and, you're, and, you're back. You're good. Yeah, and, and I was saying, so when you take for, for, I'm going to give one last example and then we'll move on. Uh, yeah. When you look at the example of China, mm -hmm. you know, when we speak of China, everybody knows about Mao, Mao Zedong, the great revolutionary of China. But if you look at the output of China, it was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. What happens, why China is today the second power in the world? Because Deng Xiaoping, the second president after Mao, opened private property. He said people have the right to own property. Mm -hmm. So when he, he, he gave that right to people to own property, in China, people don't have political rights. Like they mm -hmm. cannot... Um, with political parties and stuff like that, but economically they, they have rights. You say you mm -hmm. have the right to own property, you have the right to have a business and etc. What happened? Poverty started to shrink and growth started to occur exponentially. Mm -hmm. And today you cannot go in China. So Simple because like it's, it's because individual it's because individuals and corporations decided to uh basically started becoming owners that yes. they, started, they started to breed competition and then when it started yes. to breed competition then people were motivated to to go to absolutely. the next level but, absolutely and this is human nature no matter what your race is and that's where africans don't get it they think that because they're african they're black so they're completely different from the rest no we're human beings okay <laughs> and human beings obey to a set of laws there is a set mm -hmm. of laws that you need to follow in order to achieve a certain goal in life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what your race is. And when it comes to a society to be successful economically, to increase its living standard, if you do not allow people to have private property, they are going to be poor. It's crystal clear. Again, mm -hmm. you have people like Julius Malema, 
who are preaching the same mistakes that people like Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, all these great revolutionaries did. The data mm. is there. I'm not inventing those things. Man, you, the you, data you, is are, there. you are saying a lot of stuff. So you're trying to tell, you're trying to say that, you know, people like Kwame Nkrumah, they've, <laughs> they've been holified. You know, they've, they've been, uh, it's, it's, it's like they, they haven't, you know, they, they pushed the uh, identity of Pan-Africanism, right? They pushed the ideology of Pan-Africanism, of Western Pan-Africanism to Africa. But at the end of the day, it's like, um, at the end of the day, we haven't had a result. Why? Because they were opposition. Why? Because they were opposition to them. So um, there's there's a lot more equation. There's a lot more variable into this equation. No, you know, so. I, I disagree. I disagree. And I have the data to back it up. You have the data you, to back you it have up. My book. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You have my book. The data is there. Mm -hmm. Why Nkrumah mismanaged the Ghanaian economy? Okay? Mm -hmm. When, Ghana, first of all, Ghana became independent, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, in 1957. The first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to become independent. They were yeah. the first producer of cocoa. Ufwe Bwani, the president of Ivory Coast. Yeah. Ivory Coast became independent in the 1960s. If you look around page, I think page 400 or 12, something like that, I mm -hmm. made a graph where I compared the GDP of Ivory Coast and Ghana, the GDP per capita, and you see that Ivory Coast uh, surpassed, the, the GDP of Ivory Coast surpassed the, uh, the, the, the GDP of Ghana during the presidency of Kwame Nkrumah and Ufwe Bwani, respectively. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Why? Because Ufwe Bwani understood he let private property do the work. Kwame Nkrumah created state-owned enterprise to, and, and, and planning, and, and it created like a, a central planning system where the state is going to plan the entire economy. You cannot plan an entire economy. It's impossible. And I can even tell you the, the economist who was who created that economic plan for Kwame Nkrumah. His name is Sir uh, Sir William Arthur Lewis. He won the Nobel Prize in 1979. You can Google it too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's the one who made that plan. It was a five-year plan, a five or seven-year uh, uh, economic plan, which failed. Mm -hmm. So it's true. It's, it's important to understand that you cannot conflate politics and economics. Mm -hmm. Politically, Kwame Nkrumah was right. Mm -hmm. Pan-Africanism, where Africans, our culture is unique, and etc. All you know, all the great things about Africa. But economically, economics obey to a certain rules. Mm -hmm. If you try to bypass these rules, no matter what your race is, you're going to fail. And that's why Nkrumah and Julius Nyerere and all these uh, leaders who adopt socialism failed. So Absolutely. to use to use socialism is not the solution for African. Growth. It's not a solution for human beings, period. Mm -hmm. Say, but I see start talking in French because I get so passionate. But it's not just for Africans, it's for human beings, period. Mm -hmm. Russians tried, they failed. In China, they tried, they failed. In Cuba, yeah. they tried, they failed. In Tanzania, in Tanzania with uh, Ubuntu, in Jerusalem, in, in Europe, they failed. Where else want to try and then you think it's going to work? Why? Because at the end of the day, human beings are individualistic by nature. You were born mm. alone, you're going to die alone. So it's your own things that you give the best for it to work. Mm. Because you have mm. responsibility toward that thing. Responsibility mm. is the key to success. If you're not mm. responsible for the things you own, you're not going to succeed. It's crystal clear. And people try to bypass this law. Yeah, you have to be responsible. Responsibility you have to keep your fingers. Yeah, you. you have to so, As we call it, you gotta have skin in the game. You, mm -hmm. you gotta have skin in the game. That's why a country like the United States is thriving economically. Economically is thriving because here people take risk. When they fail, they have to pay the price of their failure. When they mm -hmm. win, hallelujah, everybody's happy. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. what it is. That's true. So so I guess the reason why we got into politics in death is because um, you wanted to be a president, the president of Ivory Coast. That's why, that's why you were preaching when we were in school. 
I still remember every single day when we used to sit down and you used to give us lecture about politics. So now <laughs> you realize that you don't have the personality and um, the, no. So basically the, men, the mindset of politician doesn't fit your mindset and your view of life. So you say, this is not a game I want to play. And, but how about the years that you spent going to school to do political science? You went and got a bachelor's degree. You got a master's degree from George Washington University. Like, man, this is. I know. And, and let me tell you what happened. You probably missed this episode. So that's when I didn't forsake politics at all then. What I forsake was doing politics back in Ivory Coast. I still want to do politics. I mm -hmm. thought that my personality was more close, was more aligned to American culture. So I was like, okay, let me try the politics here. So I wanted to go to law school. I took the LSAT three times and I failed. Okay? Why? I took the LSAT three times and I failed. And, but however, I still managed to get into two law schools, but they were not great law schools. And on top of that, at the time, I was not a permanent resident, so I could not take like loans to go to school and then pay them back later. And that's when it was during that period that I published my first book. In mm -hmm. fact, I was I was insulted. My ego was uh, hurt mm. because I was like, these people are getting into law school. They're not smarter than me, and I'm trying, busting my ass off, and I can't get into the schools that I want to, why? Because, I mean, yes, I put this, the language barrier, everything. But I was like, but Germinal, you know how to write. Use it to your advantage. So what I did was that, I started writing books a long time ago, not even in 2018, but before that, but I used to not finish them. I used mm -hmm. to not go toward the end, toward the completion. So mm -hmm. I started to obsess myself with completion. You have to complete what you start. You have to complete what you start. So I would write, I was I was working at, at I remember I was working at Apple then. And I was I would write the days I wasn't working, I would write 10 hours a day. I mean I would take breaks in between of course, but I would write for 10 hours. Wait, you would write for 10 hours a day? Yeah, a day. Goodness. Yeah. And the that's days that because... I didn't have work. Uh, yeah, I would write for that amount of hours. My guy, so listen to this, man. You were, you got obs obsessed with finishing, completion. And you said, I'm going to focus and have laser focus on this one goal. And the one goal yeah. is to finish. Yeah, to finish. Yeah, because I started the book and I was afraid that I wouldn't finish it. And I told myself, you have to finish it. You are about your halfway to become an author. You're about you're halfway to create a career for yourself. You cannot give up. So mm. I, I would write every day for nine, ten hours. So that's why. And I tell people, if you write for that amount of hours every day in a month, you, you literally wrote a book. <laughs> literally wow. in a month. Yeah. That's impressive. You know, research, right? Yeah. So that's what I did. And then when I published my first book, it was, I have to say, it was like the greatest satisfaction in my life. Specifically when I held that book, I, was, I saw my name on it. I was like, man, you're the one who wrote this. It's you. Mm -hmm. And why people don't listen to that? It's the, the, the most difficult part is always the first one. Once the first one is out, the rest, <laughs> now is it's the first that I have been. Books. So that's why it's it's incredible <laughs> this guy is ridiculous he writes like the book that i just showed you guys this book here is 464 pages and he just put it out there like and he doesn't only write books you write articles you contribute in a few editorial you write research papers but yeah. So basically, you were going to work during the day, and then oh, you were going to work, and at the time that you were off, you would spend time writing books. Yeah, writing books. So initially, 
what was the focus of your writing? Was it to bring more ideology into political yeah. science? Was it to bring more insight, more perspective? What 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 was yeah, that? Yeah, so yeah, it was a mix. It was a mix of all of that. So at first, my writings focused a lot on political science and political science and legal theory because that was at the time I still wanted to be a politician of the law school. And then, uh, so I wanted to, and I've, I've been always into political philosophy. You know, it's about ideas, it's abstract, it's theory. I would always love those things. And by my fifth book, that's when I started getting into economics. I started listening about, uh, you know, Milton Friedman, Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, all these free market libertarians, economist mm -hmm. and when i was listening to them in fact i was learning about economics more than political ideology more than you know the, the free market ideology because the free market ideology is centered on economics and it's interesting because i've always been it might shock some of your audience but i used to be a republican but because of trump I did not want to associate myself with the Republican Party. No, seriously. I, re I remember those days. You were swearing by the Republican yeah. Party, and and oh, I yeah. was, I was, I was not a Republican, so we used to clash a lot. But keep going. Oh, I know we used to clash, <laughs> and, and but I did not want to associate myself with with the Republican Party. With Trump like the way to the problem. I know I cannot. So that's when I moved to libertarians. And libertarian. Exactly, and the lib and libertarians are very economic oriented. If you discuss with a libertarian, there are only two things usually libertarians talk about: economics mm -hmm. and political philosophy. Libertarians are very driven by economics, all the free market, uh, the government should not intervene, let people do their thing, and you will see the market will serve, we will, will basically regulate itself, and etc. They will tell you about all this economic theory. If you talk with a Democrat or Republican, they don't really talk about economics, but libertarians do. So that's when I got into economics. That's how I got into economics. Mm -hmm. So your shift to economics was was still driven by polit by political exactly. by politics by political ideology. So when exactly. you shifted your political drive, your political ideology, you saw the motive of the the new ideology that you you cling yourself into, and that was very driven by economics, which drives free market, the freedom, libertarian, is liberty, freedom exactly. of everybody to do whatever they want, and the system is gonna regulate itself, the government doesn't get interfere, like, okay, so that's interesting, man. I, I didn't yeah. know that, and, then, and that was a catalyst then, that was a catalyst of your journey into economics. Economic. Yeah, and then and I'm going to get now to my journey from economics to econometrics. Go ahead, man. <laughs> That's it. The floor right. is yours. Go ahead. Right. So when I got into economics, as I told you, I used to listen to Milton Friedman, Thomas Sowell, Friedrich von Hayek, even big one. This is all these guys. So I used to be more. I used to affiliate myself with a school of economics thought called the Austrian Economics School. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and these people. They do, they support the free market and everything. They do economics through, they see economics as a philosophy. Mm -hmm. So in fact, they do a lot of ideology behind their economic analysis. Mm -hmm. And the problem mm -hmm. I had with that was that the ideology you support does not prove that your point is right. Mm -hmm. Does not prove that your theory is valid. In order in economics to prove that the theory you hold is valid, you have to measure it. You have mm -hmm. to test it. You cannot you test the theory. Yeah, yeah, you cannot test just, the theory. Reason. Just like the, just like the scientific method. If you have an, the, basically the theory is like the hypothesis. So once you have your hypothesis, right. then you you move into the step of testing it, which is the scientific. Exactly. Oh, okay. Exactly, and that's when I reach a a wall. And I was like, okay, I understand economics from a philosophical standpoint, which is very important. Like for anyone that gets into economics, you need to understand the philosophical background of economics. Like why we have the free market, why we have Keynesian economics, why we have, uh, I don't know, Marxist economics. Like 
because economics at the end of the day is based on a series of events that were driven by a cert by certain ideas. So it's important mm -hmm. to understand that. Mm -hmm. But now, when you want to prove that your economic theory is actually valid, you got to step away from the ideas and get into measurement. And that's when I knew that if I wanted to become a, if I want, because I, I knew that I understood economics and I was, I started doing serious economic works and I wanted to become an economist. I, I knew that I was becoming without saying it because the thing with it the, the, the good thing about economics is that it's not like law or medicine where it's regulated by the government you know you need to pass a series of exams that need to be approved etc with economics so long as you write about economics so long as you do work about economics you're technically an economist but of course if you want to be recognized by the profession you need to be part of associations uh, you need some credentials you know like a phd or they are passing a set of exams and stuff like that. I have a question for you, man. So, so basically, you have been driven by your curiosity. Your curiosity yeah. to always challenge what you know. Yeah. And then, that, I, go ahead. No, no, because, no, what I wanted to say is that the reality is that at, at the end of the day, you don't know until you experience it. That's mm -hmm. what we call empiricism. Empiricism means it comes from your senses, from your vision, from touching, from tasting, so anything that you can sense. So to me, you do not know until you experience it. Mm -hmm. And experience comes with measurement. And that's experience why measure. I measure. And that's when I realized that journal if you want to be considered as a serious economist you have to take that step forward you gotta get into mathematics and that's when now it's becoming interesting this is powerful man so <laughs> yeah. so you basically got interested into economics and then your interest for economics drove you to say you know what i want to be an economist mm. now I want to be an economist, but to be an economist, you have to write books. You have to write publication. You don't have to have a degree. And that's the powerful thing about it. You don't have to have a yeah. degree and say, I have a JD, uh, you know, a, a JD in law to be a, a lawyer. No, you just have to be, exactly. you just have to have enough scientific or let's say paper written to basically have your credibility. Absolutely. And even if you look, for instance, Adam Smith, right, who is considered the father of economics, he was a moral philosopher. He was a philosopher. He wasn't an economist at all. He only wrote two books in his life. The first book is called A Theory of Moral Sentiments. And the second book is called The Wealth of Nations. And that book is the most written book ever. Because of that book, the guy became an economist. But he's not a trained economist. Even mm. John Maynard Keynes, right? Even John Maynard Keynes, you know, when you, you heard that were Keynesian economics, Keynesian economics, that was yeah. by John Maynard Keynes. John Maynard Keynes was not an economist. He was a mathematician. <laughs> you see, he was a mathematician. Mm -hmm. Even, yeah, there was another economist, his name is Friedrich von Hayek. He was Austrian. He was a lawyer. He wasn't a, a trained economist. So that is to tell you that so long as you just work in that field, you are that. Now, if you want to prove to the world that you're in fact that, maybe you need to take some steps forward. But people, because people tend to think that to, to be an economist, you need to be necessarily an academic economist, which means you have a PhD in economics and you're a professor. No. An economist is simply someone who does economic work. And for instance, I'm currently working on launching soon my consulting firm which will do economic work oh yeah it's a lot of time oh yeah we do economic yeah. work so okay 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 hold on 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 you are a political science guy man you legit have your whole track record is political science but you have the boldness yeah. to now trying to launch your 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 economic firm now like my question to you is this you talk a lot about European author. 
But do we have any economists right now in Africa with a, like, do we have a culture of economics from Africa, from your research? Yeah, we actually have George Ayite, who is a Ghanaian economist that I really like. Uh, we have Mamadou Koulibaly, who was a former president of the National Assembly, a great economist that I like too. Alassane Ouattara, who is an economist. Really? And, uh, that guy? Oh yeah, Alassane Ouattara, he's, yeah, he's an economist. That, that's his job. That's his, that, was, his, that was actually his job. But you, you see, for instance, Alassane Ouattara was not a professor, he was not an academic economist. He got his PhD, then he went to work for, for the United Nations or for the IMF. For, for an organization. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty about economics. Like, you don't need to be a professor of economics to prove that you're an economist. So long as you do economic work for a firm, let's say, for instance, that Louis, you, you're looking for an economist to do some economic work on, on the life job to see, for say, how many people you're going to hire and stuff like that. You're going to hire me, for instance. You say, I'm looking for mm -hmm. economists. That's what economists do. Simple as that. Yeah, mm. but you know, now back to your question. In Africa, the problem is that we don't praise our economists. That's the issue. We don't praise. We praise our politicians, but we don't praise our economists. And the problem with politicians is that when you look at the African context, most of the politicians we know used to be poor, and they use politics to become rich. And you know how we call this concept? We call that rent seeking. Rent seeking is when you use the political process to create wealth for yourself without creating wealth for society. Mm. That's why that's why rent seeking is because it's rent. You see, you have the concept of rent in it. It means that you're renting something, you're renting the political process. Like you're using the political process to enrich yourself. Mm. Compared to you, for instance, who are using the private sector, you gotta pay taxes four times for four, four times a year. Right? Because you, you own a business. You, you, you got to take risk. If it fails, you pay the price for it. Politicians mm. don't. Politicians don't. And that's, that's why... why the mm -hmm. Because most of our politicians, they were all broke. They got into politics and now they became billionaires. Who are we kidding here? Right? <laughs> so, okay. Um... So we have a few economics, uh, econ economy, ec economist, economists in Africa, right? Do they have literature th that with a track record? Like, do they have literature, to theoretical literature that has been applied in different African countries and has succeeded? Uh, on that one, I am not sure. I don't want to say something that I'm not sure about. I know George Aite has a lot of theoretical literature. I don't know if they've been applied because if theoretical literature mainly focus on criticizing socialist policies from mm. Af in African countries. Uh, there is an African economist, uh, his name is uh, Boateng Kwabena, I think. Mm -hmm. He's been doing a lot of labor, a lot of labor economics. There is another economist that I know personally, who is my friend. His name is Moon Ulata. He's a professor of economics at, uh, at uh, American University. Oh, really? He's, okay. he's Ivorian. Yeah, he's, he's, he's actually Ivorian. Um, but but yeah, we I, don't have but we don't have like um, let's say economists like that are training the next generation of ec economists in the in Africa to drive our free labor market, that, our I, free market, and all that? None that I know of, personally. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some, but I don't know them personally. That okay. was personally, like, at least to my knowledge. I'm sure mm -hmm. they are. I, I, I can't say, I cannot speak for the whole continent and say that no, no, that's not true. I'm yeah. sure there's some economy. But the problem is, and that comes to my 15th book, when we wrote about, my friend and I, we wrote about the African Nobel Prize. That's why we want to create a Nobel Prize in Africa, to, to, to bring to light our intellectuals. Because there are plenty of intellectuals back home. No one knows them. Why? Because even in Africa, we don't promote them. We promote entertainment. Mm. Today, people who have influence are those who create, they sing one, one or two lyrics, and they're famous. <laughs> we're all into emotions. No, seriously, we're all into emotions and stuff like that. I'm not saying it's bad to do music and everything. Of course, it's beautiful. We need that. But to my but the, the truth of the matter is 
when you want to develop yourself, you need science, you don't need art. Mm. That's, it's called by the show. And Philip Simon always said this, Africa needs laboratories, we don't need stadiums. Africa needs engineers, doctors, bankers, lawyers, economists, uh, architects. That's what we need. We don't need any more sportsmen. We don't need any more athletes. We don't need any more singers. We have too many of them. Mm. Have you seen mm. a country that has, has has reached a high level of 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 of, uh, of uh, economic development through soccer or basketball? Give me a break. No, no, no. Yeah, so, because it, no, because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. That's the point. So, so that's why we don't know enough of our intellectuals back home. And so most of the intellectuals we know, and most of the intellectuals we know are, you know, the literature guy, which is good. I mean, they write about African culture and identity, which is very important. But we need to know more about our scientists mm -hmm. because they're the ones who apply the knowledge for the development of the infrastructures of the country. You cannot mm -hmm. use the road without a civil engineer. No. You cannot no. have buildings without a civil engineer. Mm -hmm. You cannot have electricity without an electrical engineer. That's a reality. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. So, so here's the question. Um, yeah. You got interested into politics, okay? You got interested into into economics, and then you started writing. You started writing all these articles, and you started becoming. You started training yourself to becoming an, an economist. So, how did you transition from e e economics to econometrics? To econometrics. Okay, that's when now the that's when now the, the juice is going to flow. Mm -hmm. So, I, as I said, I realized that in order for me to be considered an economist, I need to apply to mathematics. And mathematics, you know, people are strongly afraid of mathematics. You know. But the problem is because in school, teach and I blame teachers for that. Teachers never explain to children why mathematics is important. And you see, it comes back again to the concept of self-interest. When you when you explain to someone why doing something will benefit him or her personally. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what is missing in our that's what is missing in our educational system in Africa. And even among the black community, we go to school or our parents send us to school, not telling us what we're doing, what we're going to school for. Our teacher are teaching us, not knowing, not telling us exactly why we are learning what we are learning, which is the difference with the school system uh, with self-education. Which is the difference with self education? So, the, self the, the, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I actually wanted to, to, uh, to, to, want to emphasize on that a little bit. So, the beauty of self education is that you learn it yourself. In fact, mm. you're the master of what you're learning. Mm. Traditional education is that you're learning for the grades because you need to move up to the next class to get your degree. Yeah. But self-education is learning for you, and that's how I learned math. So when I realized that I need mathematics and economics to, to do my work, what did, what did I do? I said, you know what? At first, I was contemplating of going back to school to get a, a degree in applied mathematics. But I was like, instead of spending money, I'm going to go on Khan Academy, free. And Louis, when COVID hit, this is what happened. I was studying mm. math every day, Monday through Friday from 10 to 3. I started with pre-calculus. Because Wait, you, school, you started from pre-calculus. Yeah. In high school, That's, you stop at pre-calculus. Yeah. Yeah, you stop at pre-calculus in high school. So you basically that's what I love about you, man, because you do not let the journey be an obstacle to your end goal. It's a it's an opportunity, and 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 I, I want to say you know the thing with people is that they think that if they don't achieve what they got what they have in mind they fail. No, in life you're going to fail because you, there are many variables you don't control. What you control is your decision to do something. Mm. You do not necessarily control the outcome. Mm. 
that's why we say you sh you should measure the outcome by the opportunity and not measuring the opportunity by the outcome. What does he mm. mean? And I used to do that myself. I'm speaking from experience. Measuring the opportunity by outcome means that based on what the outcome will be, you start selecting what opportunities you will take. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is that by do by proceeding with that method, you are actually discriminating against opportunities that will take you to, to better outcomes that you did not even think of. Okay. Right? Oui. That's yes. a problem of many people. Instead, you should measure the outcome by the opportunity. It means that based on the fact that you don't know where this is going to take you. <laughs> this, is, this is scary. That's yeah. basically an entrepreneurship. A lot of people want exactly. to know exactly Absolutely. everything. They want exactly. to know everything. They want to know, like, if I make this decision, I'm going to get this outcome. So I'm going to make the decision. So if I make this, but whereas real entrepreneurship is all about just going into the fire, knowing that you're going to make it through because you're going to be able to figure it out. Exactly. One way or another, you have to figure out. And I'm always telling this. Every single human being has abilities. But in order to express that abilities, you have to treat life as a matter of life or life or death. Whatever mm. you want to accomplish, you have to have. But because the thing, you know, when something doesn't burn you enough, you don't understand that value. You don't understand its value. It has to burn you. Like, it's, it's like, let's say you're in a place and you have nowhere to go and there's a pit bull coming at you. It's you or the guy. It's you or the people who's going to eat you. What are you going to do? You're going to figure something out to save your life. That's how mm -hmm. you should attack life in anything. But when you, you, you take things in a way that, oh, I have nothing to lose, you're not going to give yourself it. Mm -hmm. Me, I wanted to be an economist because I realized that this is where I am excelling. So, as I said, we, as I, I, I work, I was basically with COVID, everybody's home. I was basically doing mathematics every single day. I started pre calculus 10 to 3 every day. Until I'm done, I'm not getting up. Until I'm done, when I start at 10 o'clock, what I would do is that I would wake up around. 7 7 30 brush my teeth go downstairs get my coffee read for an hour every day i read i read for an hour an hour and a half at least reading is the best engine to get your brain started for the day mm -hmm. and then i watch a little bit of philip mm -hmm. oh yeah always mm -hmm. nine o'clock and then 9 30 10 mathematics i started from i remember i started with complex numbers all the way to matrix algebra and then and then I moved to calculus one. And then I moved to calculus one. And then I start doing like limits, derivatives, yeah. then, then integral. And then I moved to calc two. But even when I was in calc one, when I started with calc one, that's when I said it's time to do econometrics. I used to be afraid of the thing. You have no idea. Econometrics used to scare me. So you basically looked at you were at Calc 1 and said, let me go into econometrics, but to, to do econometrics, the basis, the foundation of econometrics is statistics. So statistics and mathematics. It's statistics and mathematics. But statistic and statistic and statistic and calculus are not the same beast. Absolutely it's, not. It's two different worlds. Mm -hmm. So you, you and I know statistics scares a lot of absolutely a lot of people. Yeah. But the thing is that I uh, because I already got the mathematical thinking. That's why it was easier to do statistics. So what did I do? I typed on YouTube how to do a simple linear regression by hand. Simple That's linear it. regression by hand. Yeah. It's, it's a 10 minute video, the most powerful video I ever watched. How to do a linear regression by hand. I watched that video more than five, five times to make sure. And then it took me three hours to do the regression because I did it by hand. People say, oh, you can do it uh, on the computer. I said, no. When you want to understand something, you have to do it by hand so that the theory gets in your brain and you understand it. So that's what mm -hmm. I did. Oh, yeah, like I would collect the data by hand. I would do all the calculations by hand as if I was in the 19th century. I kind of put myself in the shoes of the people who used to be back then and use statistics. It wasn't easy. And that's what I did, and that was like, 
Then the rest can happen. But the beauty about, I think the beauty about your methodology is that you, in parallel, you do a lot of reading about the ideology, the philosophy of these people that came up with this concept. So as you write and as you dissect different concepts and different ideologies, what you do, you also, you also understand the era when they were putting it together, which is very powerful. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. That's right. History is very yeah. important. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, I actually want to say something. I want to tell people here about mathematics. Because how did I transition? Like, how did I change my mind? In fact, everything is a matter of mindset. You know, when people see a paper, they see integrals, they see all these symbols, they're afraid. But I always tell them this. When you were born, did you know how to drive? No. The person. Exactly. You don't. You, you learn, right? I say it's the same with mathematics. You learn. And how do you learn? You have to ask yourself, how is it going? How am I going to use it? How is it going to benefit me? Um, how the math is going to help me express my idea? The reason why people are not good at math is because they focus on, on the level of difficulties. Mm. The first thing they do is that, oh, how hard is it? No, why do you care about how hard is it? Why don't you ask about how is it going to help me express my theory or help help me do some calculation that I need to do to, you know, to move to the next step? That's how you should think about math. Because those symbols are there. It's like, it, it's like you see a car. The car doesn't drive itself. The car needs someone to drive it. It's the same with math. Those symbols are there. They're not... You don't use they, they, they don't use themselves. They have functions like a knife. A knife doesn't work. You someone needs to take the knife to do whatever he wants to do with it. Mm -hmm. So so, yeah. so this this is something that I'm actually pulling out from everything that you're sharing about mindset. When we are facing a specific situation, like in this case, a statistic, when we are facing an, an obstacle, okay. We should look at it as, how is this going to benefit me? And I think that's what you say when you think about the free market. The reason why African countries don't succeed uh, in the free market or let's say in econom economically is because we tr we're still trying to op operate with this Ubuntu mindset. But in this Ubuntu mindset, which is very so socialist mindset, what happened is that, um, what happened is that People don't see the benefit for them. They don't. And the fact that they don't see the benefit for them, then they take it for granted. Absolutely. You got it. And they don't give 100% like they're supposed okay. to give. Whereas if it was for them first, they were going to go 100%. Absolutely. So which when we go back now, we get, we get we extrapolate and we're trying to come up with, from a mathematical standpoint now, it's like, when we see uh, when we see statistic, instead of saying it's hard, we should say, "How is that going to benefit me to get exactly. into into econometrics?" Absolutely, and that's how I got into econometrics because once I performed my first linear regression by hand, I was now driven by learning the principal linear regression, and then I made a sheet. I created a sheet of all the all the regressions that exist, and I said, "I'm going to learn all of them." I mean, I haven't learned all of them, but I know a lot of statistical methods that mm -hmm. I can use. Yeah, so, and, 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 and what I love about econometrics is that in economics specifically, because people love to argue, specifically people in the Austrian school, they love to argue about how the free market and blah, 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 government should never intervene and stuff. Once you start using econometrics, you become more nuanced. Because you're like, okay, you're saying this, but all you're doing is some political philosophy, all you do is ideology. I you test your theory. Have you measured it? Because mm -hmm. to me, I'm not going to buy what you're telling me unless you measure it. Show me the data, show me the measurements. And since I've been using econometrics, my books are very scientifically driven. Like there is no, if I want to prove that, for instance, the free market is superior to something, I test it. I don't just say the free market is superior because this is what happens. No, I test the theory. And I'm very so, by so my, my friend, there's a question for you. You wrote a lot of book on Africa and Africans and African and African. Do we have a lot of data data in Africa? We actually do. 
Oh yeah, we do. When you look at the African Bank of Development, oh absolutely, they literally give you an entire, they have like a hundred pages of data. Where they literally give you, they talk to you about the macroeconomics of African countries. Absolutely. The World Bank, the IMF, the UNESCO. So these, these people actually, they, that's all they do, they collect data. Oh, yeah, they collect data, yeah, absolutely. So There's Africans, African themselves, do they have a data a data center for themselves? Or oh, yeah, yeah. Every, 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 every African country has at least a national bureau of, of, of statistics. Mm -hmm. Every African country has a, it's just that, Louis, people don't read. People don't read back home, that's a problem. People don't pay attention to those things. No, I, no, nobody care. I, I mean, I didn't care about it, so I believe that a lot of people don't care about that. So yeah, no, they don't, they don't, but they, every country has a national bureau of statistics. How, for instance, do we, do we find that? You remember, you know, Zimbabwe, they have like a, a trillion dollar bill? Yeah. Exactly, because the National Bureau of Statistics of Zimbabwe did some statistics, did some econometric analysis, and found out that Zimbabwe got into hyperinflation. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, the National Bureau of Statistics. So we have data, but do we have, I, I guess, do we have a lot of like Africans that are going into that field of statistic to to help, I would say, bring more data out so that we can better understand our markets and so that we can improve Africans our markets. Do, there are some Africans who do, but not a lot. And, you know, and that's where I'm going to come back to the point of Philippe Simo when he said that people want easy money. You know, the thing with education is that education is a long-term investment. Mm. And when you get into that, as a scholar, like sometimes you get frustrated because you write books and stuff, and you have a feeling that your work is not appreciated. And that's even one of the reasons why people who win the Nobel Prize, they win it when they're old. It's rare to see someone in his 30s winning the Nobel Prize. Mm. You see what I mean? It's because education is a long-term investment. Intellectual activities are long-term investment. It's something you do, and you don't see the fruit until way later, mm -hmm. right? And Africans are not patient. We rather get into entertainment because entertainment is fast. It's 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 in the moment. It's right now. If you make it and you're famous, and you're, oh, and that's it. But, but so we need we need scholars, but not a lot of people want to go into the field of scholars because again, germinal people are still in the equation of of needs people see the teacher of their basic and, needs and, and, and the worst is that our governments don't do much to help our governments unfortunately do not promote scholarship that's a mm. problem that's you true see? they don't promote yeah. they don't promote research they don't promote research that's right yeah, exactly when you look at in, in in south korea they promote research there when, when you look at in europe you know in the united states there are prizes for those things they that's promote right. the electro stimulation back home. We don't. And that's why people don't go in those fields. But let's say in Cameroon, Paul Biard decide to create a national. I mean, you know, I'm his opponent. That's why I say Paul Biard. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. But let's say and Paul that... Biard decide to create a, a, a national prize of science where you don't have to necessarily be a professor. Everyone has a, has a chance to make it. All you mm. need is. Here are the parameters, the conditions. You need to publish uh, this, this, and that, and blah, blah. You don't even need to, to publish a ton of books. Just like you need to make a certain contribution. You will see how people will be devoted. That's what they did, the Nobel yeah. Prize. And that's what we, we talk about in that book. You mm -hmm. have to promote research. People don't. And that's why, and as I said, Mandela said it many times, education is the foundation of the development of the society. If people are not educated, and when I say educated, it's not about getting a PhD. It's about having enough intellectual competence to make uh, to, to, to make important decisions. Mm -hmm. That's what being, being educated is about. And when you have half of the people who do not have a high level of literacy, it's a problem. Yeah, I mean, I, you have to understand our, our school system don't teach a lot of, um, uh, I would say, critical thinking. And, but, but, but I'm going to return you the question. Why, why do you think they don't teach them critical thinking? Um, because if, you, if you're taught critical thinking, you're going to question everything about the system. 
Yes. That's why we don't. And, 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 and who implement that? Politicians. Now you understand why I don't. I, I ask that problem. No, seriously. Louis, I cannot go in front of people and tell them that if you vote for me, I will eradicate poverty and unemployment. No. I'm too brutally honest to go in and lie to you just for your votes. I don't need political, I don't need the political process to be rich. Mm. If you want to be rich, do mathematics. <laughs> Seriously, mathematics will make you rich. How? Like just going to it. I mean, oh, yeah. I'm just, to so, so now there's a question here. There's a question here. There's a question real quick. A question, there's a question that's it's been here for a long time. So I'm going to ask okay. question. How is the job market in the U.S. hard because of the virus? Absolutely not. It's not hard at all. In fact, if you study mathematics, statistics, you will get a job. You don't even need to move because, Louis, I'm working as a data analyst from home. I don't need that's, to move or anything. And that's, and that's something I'm going to say, too. Okay, so just for people that are here, it's a quick detail. Um, uh, Germinal uh, has a bachelor's and a master's in political science. He is a self-taught economist. He took his classes at Cannes Academy, yep. and YouTube, YouTube yep. and, Co and Coursera. Yep. And, 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 and actually, and let me add to this, mm -hmm. it's my course on Coursera on statistics that got me the job as a data analyst. Okay, man, this is powerful, man. Just let me let me let me let me repeat that again. He is he has a bachelor's and master in political science, which is very literate literature driven. I could not get a job there, Louis. I work so, in restaurants. He I, used I, to work I sales, everything. I couldn't get a job with political science. With political and I know I know a young lady. I'm gonna send her this snippet of this video. I told her, don't do political science, please. Don't do this thing. Don't do this, please. <laughs> Well, she want to dig political science. I said, what kind of job are you going to get? I want to be a pre-law. I want to get into law school. I said, no, go do economics. Go do business. Go do supply chain management. Go do finances. Go do something that has to do with money and moving money and moving supply and moving things that make the economy move. Go yeah. do that. Because hey, Louis, here's I, used to, Louis, I used to not understand that when my, because my mom, if I want me to do bank. My mom wanted me to do economics, banking, finance, anything that is with business. And I used to be that idealistic, romantic, <laughs> yeah, dogmatic, yeah. Oh, it's politics, I'm going to be president, I need to study politics. When I graduate, I, 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 when I graduate from Catholic, I, I interned, because with politics, what happens? You're going to get a lot of unpaid internships. Yes. And then you have people in power who can suit you. Mm -hmm. That's what you're going to do. That's it. That's what I, I, to me. Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw I saw I saw the picture, man. I already saw the picture. I'm like, go because there's a thing, there's a reality that people don't understand. When the COVID hit last year, there's been there, 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 a lot of shift happened. A lot of shift happened in, in, in the job market. And we went from fighting for paper towel, you know, fighting for but what what when we when you look at the equation behind the whole fight. Well, and what was happening is that we were fighting for supply, but we need people that need to move supply. We need people that know how to manage product. We need people that know how to manage even logistic and money. We need people that need to manage data to understand what is going on. And this man right here, when the economy hit, he saw that there would be a need in data analysts. A data analyst, a lot of people will go to school to become data analysts. You took a class at Coursera. And for those who don't know, Coursera is a platform where you go, you take a class for free, or you say you pay $60 for depending on the class. But those yeah. classes are offered by American accredited yeah. university. Yeah. Basically, is a teacher that will be teaching you the class if you went to the school and pay $5,000 for the class. You will pay for that same class for $60. And then you can decide to say, I don't want to. I don't want the I don't want the certificate. You still have the knowledge and the, the, the grades and everything. But if you want the, the certificate, you just pay a fee of sixty bucks and they send you a certificate. And, and that then, class then you 
you put that on your resume and of course the skills you put on your resume make sure that when the, you get the interview you can perform those skills and in exactly. fact and what people don't understand is that the resume doesn't give you the job the resume only grants you the interview that's it that the interview now they're going to test your knowledge because the employers what they want the employers don't want to have to train you on what you're supposed to do what they will train you is about their system like how you know the process works at the company but for instance an employer will not teach you to run the regression i'm sorry even me once my company is ready i'm like you better not run a regression <laughs> i'm not going to teach, teach you how to run a regression you're supposed to know this what mm -hmm. i would teach you is if for instance maybe you have to 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 work on the report and the, the regression method you're going to use is a little complicated i can supervise that but if it's like a simple or multiple linear regression, you're supposed to know these things. What I would teach you normally is the process of how we do the work at my company. That's what I would teach you. But I'm not going to teach you the math you're supposed or the statistics you're supposed to know. I'm hiring you for that, paying you money for that. I'm paying your health insurance for that. So you better put your skills up to date. So I'll go <laughs> no, no, first. Oh, did that become a boss? Hey. If you're yeah, 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 dictator. So uh, here's, here, here's the thing, though. Um, but I just want to make sure that people understand. I don't want people to miss the fact that you rebranded yourself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and I actually want to say something about this. Okay, I want to tell people this. Human beings are inherently free. Mm. I am an existential. Now I'm doing a little bit of philosophy here. I'm, I, I am an existentialist, which means that you are not predetermined. You are not predestined to something. Mm. You're not predestined. Okay. What is predestined? When, when do we say something is predetermined? Something that is predetermined is something that has a function. Mm -hmm. Okay? Glasses have a function, they help you see. A knife has a function, is to cut things. Unless you use it to kill, then that's another thing. But, you know, a phone has a function. It's for phone calls and for messages. But human beings don't have a function. What human beings have is free will. It's free will. It's because of free will, it's because we have the ability to make decisions between good and evil that we have people who succeed, people who fail, people who go to prison. No one was predestined to go to prison. No one was predestined to fail. No one was predestined to succeed. What makes the difference between someone who succeeds and someone who fails? In the equation of success, you have, first of all, you need to have, first of all, a vision and a model that backs that vision, which is known as your business plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's good to have a vision, but it's important to put your vision on paper. Mm -hmm. Because putting your vision on paper already give, tells you what your road, what your roadmap looks like. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to basically evaluate or, or assess all the potential outcomes. You okay. Evaluate. Okay. The second now part of the equation of success is to find a niche an entrepreneur or even a so normally an entrepreneur is someone who solves problems you're looking for you have to look for a niche where there is a demand there where people are looking for something mm -hmm. okay and then you specialize yourself in it you mm -hmm. have to be the best when people ask me who is my favorite who is my which person inspires me the most? To be honest, I'll tell them it's Cristiano Ronaldo. And the reason mm. why, and this is not even because of the song, I actually don't like his soccer at all, but mm -hmm. the drive this man has, oh my God, I'm, tell, I'm talking about him, I, I have chills. This man is, Cristiano Ronaldo is the type of man that will succeed in anything he does because he's driven. Mm. You need to have him, Cristiano Ronaldo specializes himself you have to specialize yourself into something so that mm. you become the number one at that. Once you find a niche, if you don't know a skill, learn it. 
Everything is learnable. Again, were you when you, when you were born? Did you know how to drive at the time you were born? No, you learn. So you can learn anything in life. Mm. Anything you need. The only thing when you learn, focus on what the rules and properties of the domain you learn. That's all. The, the rules and properties. properties. That's how I learned mathematics. Actually, to tell you. Yeah, because no. once you, once you have the rules and you 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 remember you master all the rules, then it's everything over. is just it's over. That's yeah. true. And then because when you replace with the num the numbers don't matter. It's the rules, it's the rationale behind it. That's all. That's all you need is the rules. Because once you understand the rules, it doesn't matter whether it's, it's a, a root square of x. It doesn't matter root cause of x over y. It doesn't matter. It's that. The rule is there. You apply it, and that's how I learned math. I focus on the rule. I did not focus on the numbers, and that's the reason why people are not good at math. Like they focus on the number, and then the minute you switch a little bit the numbers, they panic because they don't know the rule. Mm -hmm. So you need to learn the rules and the properties of the domain you're in. Mm -hmm. That's how you become successful. If you want to know why Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world, because he understood the rules and properties of entrepreneurship. And then the fourth, which is the most, which is like the most important, is that variable that, in the, but that variable is not quantifiable. Mm. Commitment. 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 Because at the end of the day, you can have a vision, you can have a plan, a model for your vision, you can find a niche, and you can have the skills. But if you're not committed to what you do or this, they become nullified. They, they equal to zero. Mm. Why? Because at the end of the day, commitment. When you don't commit, what do you do? You abandon. Mm -hmm. You give up. And when you give up, everything you did before. That's yeah, matter. basically everything goes down the drain because it doesn't matter exactly. anymore. You can exactly. you could have gone like a hundred percent for like five, exactly. for like six months, and then the day that you the, the week that you decide to just like not commit to your purpose, everything just like exactly, and that's. Why the difference is between people who succeed and those who fail is because people mm. who succeed, they stay committed to what they started. Consistency, man. Consistency. Because once now you're committed, now you become disciplined. Mm. Now you mm, that's good, and man. And, and, and discipline, president, the former president of Ghana, uh, Jerry Rollins, one of my favorite president, actually, he said, Discipline is the bridge between your goals and your accomplishments. Okay? Because your goals is what you have in mind. No one knows. You can have all the goals, but at the end of the day, you know what? No one cares because your goals are intangible. What mm -hmm. will judge you on is your accomplishment. Accomplishment mm -hmm. is what we see. Today, for instance, I'm going to give you a very, very simple example. And it Look at Kim Kardashian. She's a billionaire. Whether you like it or not, she's a billionaire. It doesn't matter. She even wrote on her own Twitter, not bad for a girl with no skills. <laughs> when Forbes says that she's a billionaire, she knows she sucks. But she's a billionaire. That's her accomplishment. You cannot take that away. Even because if she drops from the Forbes list. Because of, a, because of a commitment to the journey. Exactly. Whatever, whatever, whatever her journey. Yes, she started with sex and all this, but at the end of the day, she stayed committed to whatever she was doing. And today mm. she's a And that takes a long time, man. Because when you talk about time. when you talk about like people's journey, um, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was just listening to an episode of a man that that launched the the first. He was actually a corporate lawyer, a partner in a big company, in a big law firm. And we decided to quit his job and and basically saw a need, which was, uh, you know, let's say condom, for example, uh, let's say in the condom industry out there, it, there's not one black person that owns it, but black people uh, con uh, consume 40 percent, co consume 40 percent, 17 percent of the population consume 40 percent of the condom industry. And this guy said not one dollar goes into the pocket of black people. And he said, you know what, let me be that guy. And it's been 10 years that he's been putting a company together. 
He's and a black person or a white person? He's a black guy. First black black uh, black, black owner of uh, of a condom company in America. So it's like when you talk about it, it's like ten years commitment, and he's just getting started. And, and and that's what people need to understand. People because people want immediate results. Anything that has value takes time. Because if you get the results you want immediately, you will not appreciate its value. Mm. And Jeff Bezos says this. He said when people ask him why is he so rich, he said simply, "Here's his, his strategy. When you talk about making money, in fact, think about bringing value." Because when you bring value to the market, people want more. When you think about money, people will know and you will not make money. Jeff Bezos always said, focus on the customer. Deliver the best service to the customer. Because when the customer is satisfied, what does he do? He talks to his friends or her friends about that, about your company. Oh my God! Oh, Amazon guy, you buy that thing. The next day, is 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 they they drop it on your porch. And if you don't like it, if you want to return it, they have a policy in twenty four hours they refund it. Who is not going to take it? Simple as that. Focus on the customer. Jeff Bezos did not create Amazon because he wants to become a, a billionaire. He just loved business. He just because entrepreneurship is a lifestyle. Yes. He wanted to have that lifestyle. He wanted to be free to run his company the way he wants. But but it's just becoming rich one day, but he didn't think of becoming that rich. But it's it's it, the journey. The journey to the journey is always what is very interesting because when you look at a person like him, he started. He basically dedicated his whole life to this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And for most of the time, he was eating. He was, he was eating can of food. Oh yeah, okay. and, 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 and what and, and what people said, and when people ask about, oh yeah, what kind of uh, boss Jeff Bezos was, he was a tough boss. But why? Because he wants results. People judge you by the results. No one cares about your goals. Which is yeah. about which which takes us into econometrics. Econometrics yeah. is is really testing and in, in data data driven. Yeah. So what does the data say? If there's a data show that we are making progress, there's a data show that we're not making exactly. progress. And if we're exactly. making progress, then we adjust, we, we optimize. If we're not making progress, we adjust we, so that we can optimize. Absolutely. That's what it's about. And, 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 and that's the mindset. People need to understand that you are a free individual. To come back to my point, we are free. Individual. No one is protesting. So you have to be flexible with the things you do. Mm -hmm. Always measure always measure the outcome by the opportunity. Go with the flow. Because whatever you have in mind, whatever plans you make, life will slap you in the face to tell you stop. I'm the one who decides when it's your time to shine. Mm. So Mr. Germano, thank you so much. It's been a, an hour and a half. So now we're gonna kind of like get into the, the last part. What I'm gonna do is uh, what I usually do here is I I do the atalaku, which is the time when I basically put forward every single one of your work. Okay, for okay. anybody that's listening to this in live or when you're gonna listen to it later in the future, um, I want you to do the first thing. First thing first, uh, if you wanna learn more about mathematics, econometrics, economics, science, philosophy, economics versus statistic. Mm -hmm. which you know <laughs> which one is harder go to germinal page uh let me close this one here okay so you have his page here germinal j van he has 952 subscribers right now we we're gonna push for a thousand by the end of this week so if you're watching this or listening to this go check out his channel if you are passionate about mathematics and love mathematics he has a whiteboard where he just goes and then does a bunch of mathematics equation regression i used to there was once once they were back in the day man you can ask my wife i used to love math man i used to love these things but now i'm just trying to find a way to make more money so but 
he, this is it. He has a bunch of videos here. Go check it out. And then from time to time, he talks about. Um, oh, and, and it's funny because on this channel, people will see, in fact, my progression. How? Because the first videos you see, they're all about politics. Yeah. Political science, ideology, political philosophy. I even used to call myself a philosopher. And then you will see how I, no, seriously. And then you see how I transition. That's mm -hmm. why I never got rid of these videos because I want people to see my transformation. Yeah, hey, that's it. That's that's the process, man. Process, yeah. process, process. Document the process. Once you document the process, and then people are gonna start like, asking you, why did, how did you become this person? And this is what I love about your journey, man. You taught yourself economics, things that people think they have to go and get a PhD. You taught yourself that, and now you are working in co in the corporate world from home. Meanwhile, yeah. you're writing books and yeah. still doing all this other stuff. So it really shows that, to be honest, it's about time Africans need to start to wake up and educate themselves. That's why I keep saying, educate yourself. This is why we started this channel. We're bringing you people that are doing those kind of things so that you can see that having your degree doesn't guarantee you're going to have the best job. The job market is shifting and if you're not picking up now we're talking about artificial intelligence we're talking about uh virtual reality we're talking about like basically since oh, last and, year and, and, and louis i in fact i i, I want to mention one thing real quick if you look what COVID has what COVID has done is that the economy now is the shape of a k what that k means all the all the jobs that do so qualitative jobs and manual so anything where you have to go in the actual world to do it they decline and anything that deals with mathematics data artificial intelligence coding they go so if you look at k it goes like exactly it, it does it's the shape of a k absolutely that's man yeah. that's what that's what i've been preaching man that's why i tell people that listen to me man i keep i keep preaching this on, on subliminally on this channel people don't get i say people please go back and educate yourself man adapt to the market and adapt to the system because what's coming up in 2021 2022 the jobs that was lost is not coming back and more jobs will be lost by 2030 like, a lot of I, jobs will be lost if if there is if there is one quick advice i can give to people if there is nothing can do and you don't need to go to school for that learn how to code because coding is becoming the new alphabet yeah i see man <laughs> that's that's a new yeah, code, no, no. coding coding is going to be the new blue collar job oh yeah it's going that's to be the new scripture if you know how to code you can create anything online because we're transitioning to a virtual world and it's only the beginning Believe that's me. it but the thing is that one thing I also want to bring as we talk about your channel is as you talk about your progression, I just want to say even us in, in Africa, we have access to Coursera. We have access to Udemy. We have access to um, Can Academy. We have access to all those free resources without paying money. People, please listen. All of these are information that are online. Let's go educate ourselves. If you want to do anything now, you can just Google or your YouTube that, and you're going to have all the information to basically become whatever you want to be in the, in a week. Yeah, literally. And that's what I did. I just, and, 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 I, and I'm sure you, you know about Sun Tzu, the, the one who wrote The Art of War. He said, the best war one is the war where you spend the least resources. Mm. Right? I became an economist without having to spend a dime. And I, I, I'm doing some stuff right now, man. Tomorrow, when well, you guys are going to see me do other stuff, I'm not telling. I'm educating myself <laughs> right now. I'm, I'm going to no, do seriously. it. I swear. I, got, I, I taught myself from Coursera. Okay, Coursera, you pay 49 bucks for the certificate, but yeah. I taught myself from YouTube. I taught myself from Khan Academy. All these platforms are free. But why are we still going to school and paying? The parents getting stressed out. People are getting stressed out. They need a degree. Like, you need to do this and do that. Even, even Google and Apple 
have their own universities now. Oh, yeah. you, don't, you don't even need to go to get a degree. You just need yeah. to go to Google, Google Educate. I think it's Google Education. Let me actually look yes, for no, it. Yeah. They even, they even create, they actually, this is a, a, a spot for people who are interested in Coursera. Google create a certificate on Coursera. It's Google Data Analytics. For people who are interested in working as a data analyst for Google, they should take that course and then try. I mean, they have to build your resume and, you know, build, build your resume accordingly and, and go for it. Man. But according to that, yeah. Google create that. Now, the plenty of certificate online people can do to advance their education without spending money, without going into debt. That's what I did. Because I remember, you remember, I told you at first that I wanted to do a, a degree in applied math. In fact, this is my biggest regret. My biggest regret is to have studied political science. Wow. <laughs> it is. Yeah, you spend it. I, 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 you know, we, I'm someone who rarely regrets. I bet, I, because regret is the enemy of men. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, when I think the, the greatest regret I have is to is the fact that I did not study mathematics in college. If man, I studied that math, it would have been game over. Yeah, man, I'm about to sign up for all those classes. I'm always on Udemy. Like for me, I, I, I at some point I took my my project management uh, the course. I mean, it was. It's, it's fifteen dollars on right. YouTube. Right. Those things are great. You, you, it's it, this is a resource without spending money. That's the point. The best war one is the war where you spend the least resources. You have all these resources available to you, and you don't have to spend a dime. And that's what we need to make available, man, to African kids. Like any African kids, like if you want to learn anything that at the level of professionals, man, just tap into those platform. They're free. Yeah, and right. honestly so anyway we're going to close the, the show so real quick now i just want to take you into the trip of germinal germinal um for those who don't know um he is an author he wrote 18 books i don't know why i have this here. i don't even know how to get rid of this but anyway um <laughs> essential oil um he wrote 18 books 18 books and they are all on amazon okay there you go go check it out this is all the books you have a book that was published by Armatan, right? That's what yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. Which is which is a French publisher, a well-known French never publisher. Made, I never made a single dime on them. After why? That, I never received my first paycheck because, and that's why I self-published. Because when you you publish with those publishers, they make you pay for it, and you have to sell about five hundred copies just to touch four percent of your royalties. I, 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 whereas on Amazon, Amazon pays me every month. Every 29th of the month, Amazon send my money, whether I sold books or not. If I made zero dollars, Amazon send me my zero dollars. If I made two hundred dollars, Amazon send me my two hundred dollars. And wow. being author, and, and and this is for people, for instance, who love to write. Mm -hmm. They need to understand something. Writing may not make you a living, but if you want to become an author, you do not need to go through a publisher anymore. Amazon can make you an author. I see that. I mean, man, you, yeah, when, you, you when you started your first book, you wrote your first book, like you say, it took a long time. But you in three years, yeah. you have written 18 books. Yeah. At the rate that you're going, you're writing a book every two months. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> this guy so this is all the books that he wrote everybody uh recommend you if you are interested in 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 the in economic theory political theory um yeah. go check out his books they're going to be controversial to what you believe but you oh, need yeah. to you need to and be exposed to, con to controversy. <laughs> Man, that's what a scholar does scholars yeah. go with the ideology and the philosophy and eventually they're going to con contradict everybody else or they're gonna stand on whatever they believe and people are gonna come and criticize them. So when you when you decide to become a, a put it, a theoretical writer, you put yourself out there and yeah. you put yourself in a position of being criticized. Yeah. And at this stage, Germano doesn't care about criticism. Actually, back in the day, he used to love debate. So he used to really go for criticism because he needed to challenge people. But these are all the books that he wrote. Um, 
anybody listening to this this is page two go check it out germinal j van go check it out this is a book i wrote uh i bought here's a book that i i bought you can actually see it's gonna tell me oh you already have it you read now so this yeah. is a book i have it's a book i have i haven't read like you know, it's, it's 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 400 pages man <laughs> I, 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 I gotta go through it but this is a youtube channel this is the amazon on what amazon is acting up and for those who are still listening he is a teacher on udemy yep. he's, a, he's a teacher on udemy so listen a person that didn't take economics in university he was self taught himself economics he's now teaching economics to econometrics to people and he's making money from doing that <laughs> i don't even understand if you guys understand when people say oh there's no job in the market there's no job there's no this and that he's a prime example a person that rebranded himself took all the ego took all the pride put it on the side went back to school and taught himself pre-calculus which is 11th grade 11th grade 12th grade math this is high school math he went back and taught himself high school math now he's a data analyst for corporation and he did that in a matter of a year yeah. when the covid hit so i don't know for me this inspires me man i don't know about you guys this inspired me and i just want to just leave it out there i want you guys to be inspired by his journey by his um his determination by his mindset and i also want you to go and do the same thing for yourself covid is not going to have pity for anybody and whatever is happening in the future is not going to have pity for anybody so germinal man thank you so much for thank you very much we are really appreciate the opportunity thank you Thank you so much for sharing your journey, man. I really love your journey because you're dedicated. You Thanks. read you read more books than I don't know. I don't want to expose myself out, but you read a lot. Oh yeah. You read a lot. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is that my final word before I go is yeah. that uh, people should love working. Working is fun. I mean, of course, if you work something you don't like, then yeah, it's a chore, but. People should not see work as a chore. They should enjoy working. Working, organizing is fun. To me, I enjoy myself when I work. <laughs> I really do. Even now, I'm, I finish, I'm going to go run some regression because I have some stuff to do. This gonna... guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Germany. So on that note, everybody, man, thank you for, for listening. Thank you for listening again. Uh, let me put the microphone here. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode of the Life Jog. Uh, remember, this channel is all about investing in yourself to become a better version of yourself. And as we learn through the 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 life journey of Germinal Van, you can rebrand yourself. You can definitely rebrand yourself, and you can walk in the best version of yourself. Like right now. He live, he's like living in his, he's in his place, he's in his space of genius because he loves what he does and he's doing it at the highest level. And now he's getting paid from it, not only from a, an employer, now he has books that pays him, now he has classes that he already created that pays him, that's three streams of income. Now he's going to create another company that's a fourth stream of income. When you're talking about millionaires become millionaires, have seven or eight streams of income is by picking one niche or one expertise becoming the masters of it and diversifying that 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 mastery to earn multiple streams of income germinal you're an example i really appreciate you and everybody that listen thank you so much and have a fantastic evening <laughs>